So Chinese from uh, 1250 BCE, uh, which has a kind of uh, logo, well, this has a logographic script, uh, but with a sort of syllable-based phonology. Pew, which you already saw, uh, is kind of a segmental phonology based on a Brahmi script. Uh, Tibetan, uh, Tongut, which is more, more Chinese style script, although uh, gives even less information about pronunciation. Burmese, Newar, and Yi. And that gives you a, a sense of uh, the, the accumulation of languages with a written tradition over time, each of which has some analysis of, of uh, let's say, segmental phonology and syllable structure. The next, uh, I think, mm, kind of circumstance where linguistic analysis comes up is, is diplomacy. If you want to, you know, in the pre-modern world, if you want to talk to foreigners, uh, it's probably because of um, a diplomatic or commercial setting. And as we saw, uh, this was the case with, with Bailong. So the, the Bailong were, I mean, we only have the Chinese side of the story, but were a, a, a subject people, a kind of newly subject people uh, to the Chinese state and they presented these songs uh, to the Chinese court that so impressed the emperor uh, that he wanted them written down. Uh, so that's a kind of diplomatic context that has left us some evidence of, uh, of the language. And the Huayi Yiyu vocabularies, which I also mentioned, uh, are similar. And actually they start with, uh, they're a very complicated set of um, texts. And I wish someone would write like a, Kind of a handy companion uh, to the Huai Yi uh, vocabularies, uh, but they the, the earliest one is the secret history of the Mongols, where where the right after the the fall of the Yuan, it was clear that the that let's say Mongolian was was a very important language still uh, in China, and there's a text uh, that's actually probably the earliest in a sense uh, Mongolian text we have written in Chinese characters with a lot of special conventions for giving linguistic information and that sort of started a trajectory of documenting foreign languages uh, ostensibly with a diplomatic diplomatic context but but um, uh, not uh, entirely uh, and they, it goes right up until uh, the the basically the end, end of the Qing and there are vocabularies on French and German and and things like that but just looking at languages that are interesting to us, uh, Gyarong is covered, Tosu is covered, several Tibetan dialects, uh, particularly uh, dialects at Sichuan, uh, like Baima, uh, I think uh, uh, Baima came up in the, in the presentations of the, of the students uh, mentioning their interests, uh, and Burmese. Actually, Vietnamese also, like, uh, and, and, and for Burmese, let's say, for those languages with scripts, they give a script sample uh, and the words in, in, in Chinese pronunciation. So this is a useful resource on historical phonology, as well as, let's say, in a sense, uh, the very earliest generation of, of Sino-Tibetan linguistics. So then we turn to self-conscious uh, scholarship. And I think the earliest is, is by colonial officers, British colonial officers, and missionaries in, uh, in Burma. And in fact, actually, <clears throat> one thing that is surprising is, for instance, the Kukichin languages. Uh, more research was being done on them in the 19th century, probably than now. It's, it's changing, but that's because, you know, when Burma was part of uh, the UK, <laughs> in a sense, it was very accessible to research. Whereas then, uh, during the military dictatorship where there were international sanctions, it was less accessible. Uh, so colonial officers and, and missionaries, and then increasingly, um, you know, university-based academics. Uh, but I do, I do want to emphasize here that there's, that there's um, not hard and fast lines here. Basically, colonial officials are gone, uh, but missionaries are still, I would say, uh, half of the work that's being done on documenting Sino-Tibetan languages is still being done by missionaries. So missionaries uh, remain very important, and uh, there are universities like uh, Payap or Mahidol in uh, in Thailand that are associated with missionary work. So 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 there's a crossover between 
uh, universities and uh, and missionary work. But I also think that in the context of of China, where where um, the government is is you know governing uh, minority peoples and running universities, there's also a kind of if you like overlap between colonial officials and uh, and university based academics, particularly in the 1950s when the big uh, ethnographic classification projects were happening. Um, so now th that's sort of, you know, I don't know, my, my bird's eye view of how we get from, you know, uh, diplomatic contact, co contacts between the Han Empire and, uh, and the Bailong to, to uh, today. And then I just look at the sort of the, the, the orientation that linguistic researchers working on Sino-Tibetan languages tend to have. So field workers tend to have a functional typological orientation. And I'm not gonna talk a lot about what that means, partly because I don't know, like, uh, but it's a thing, a thing people say about themselves, is that they're functionalists and typologists. And I think basically that means that they're not Chomskyists. Um, but maybe it means something more precise than that. It does mean that people are interested in grammar uh, and in, in, in some broad sense in linguistic theory. So we study funny little languages in Asia to contribute to the understanding of language. Uh, and that means lexicography and text collections are undervalued. And I'll say, that, you know, maybe indicative of my training as a philologist and, and, and in, in Buddhist studies, this is something that kind of grieves me. You know, we don't study uh, Buddhist texts from, um, from the Tang Dynasty, for instance, because we're interested in uh, contributing to linguistic theory. It's, it has to do with trying to understand those people and their time and, and their culture and a kind of rich, diverse set of human experiences. And unfortunately, ethnographic work on Sino-Tibetan languages tends to not give attention to those uh, areas. And I also think there's a sort of a paradox uh, where a language that's easy to document is not easy to use in comparative work. And I mean that in, in a number of ways, like um, I think that there's a general tendency, I'm, I mean, this will sound a little bit uh, outrageous, but, uh, but I think uh, it's, it's pretty established, that uh, languages in kind of warm, flat places where lots of cultures have come into contact tend to, to, to be fairly uh, agglutinative and have you know, relatively simple phonology, Whereas as languages spoken in tiny mountain villages that are very isolated have more interesting agreement systems and uh, more consonant clusters and whatnot. So that means that, that, that uh, a language that's hard to get to is going to also be hard to, to document in terms of its actual structure and a language that's easy to get to where they will have you know, comfortable, delicious food uh, uh, will have a more simple structure and be easier to document. So I do think that there's a there's a pressure there for documentary work to be focused on um, on uh, a certain kind of profile of a language, but unfortunately, for for, for historical purposes, the 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 more strange and um, complicated languages, the more useful it is because just the more machinery there is to study its history. Whereas if a language is has a quite simple structure in terms of its syntax and its, its, um, its uh, uh, phonology, that means a lot of information has been lost. So I think there's a tension there that has meant that uh, the languages that have been most documented are not as useful for historical linguistics. And like I said, uh, even among, let's say, um, among everyone working in the field, there's an, a lack of attention to philology. And I think this is because Mm, Sino-Tibetan his, historical linguistics interact so much with field work and not with text-based scholarship. So that's my sort of, yes, the, the, the overall profile of researchers in Sino-Tibetan linguistics that has an impact on the kind of work that can be done and the kind of work that is being done. And now I sort of discussed the the, the various scenes. Uh, and I don't want this to become too, you know, scurrilous, uh, 
uh, and you know maybe it's good that you know uh, we can't go out to the pub or anything like that. Uh, but we'll. But I do think it's useful to have a bit of a sense of the kind of um, the different scenes, the different uh, the sociology of the discipline. So kind of schools, if you like. So there's a, what we can call the Berkeley School, uh, which was associated in the 1930s with a big uh, project um, that was as, as part of the kind of New Deal era to, to amass data on Sino Tibetan languages and write something. They, they wrote a big 12 volume book that unfortunately was never published. There were three copies made. Uh, and two of them are in the Berkeley Library. Uh, Schaefer left the project in the in the forties. Benedict took over, uh, and then and then Benedict uh, wrote the book that was eventually published in nineteen seventy two. That's been very uh, influential. And Benedict left Berkeley and moved uh, back to New York. And it was actually uh, and then and then Matasoff did his PhD at Berkeley, and had his first job at Columbia and met Benedict there, where Benedict was working as a psychologist. And that's actually where then the, the continuity happened in terms of the, you would say, the parampara, the, the, what do you say, the lineage, yeah. And then Matisoff himself ended up working back at Berkeley. So, so there is this long tradition of Sino-Tibetan uh, linguistics at Berkeley uh, from the 1930s until, until Matisoff's retirement around 2015. Uh, now, there's no one at Berkeley, as far as I know, uh, but Matasoff's, I think, his sort of, I don't know what he would say, but let's say, the student of Matasoff's who most presents himself as heir to this intellectual tradition is Randy Lapola, who's at uh, Nanyang Technological University. So, in Japan, uh, there's less, uh, maybe, of a, of a definitive kind of... Uh, lineage, but I do think that uh, it's important to, to, to just mention that the Japanese are very strong in Sino-Tibetan uh, linguistics, and particularly Tatsu Nishida shines as a sort of luminary who is someone who did field work on a bunch of, uh, of Lolo Burmese languages, uh, was perfectly competent as a Tibetologist, who wrote a monograph on, on, on Burmese as preserved in the the Huayi vocabularies, and the, all of that is a tiny part of his 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 research, most of which concentrated on Tongut. And the and the 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 fact that we can kind of read Tongut with relative ease has a lot to do with uh, Nishida's scholarship. In a way, it's 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 unfortunate that he didn't kind of found a school. Um, but there are lots of people still active in uh, in in Japan, uh, largely, or, or let's say, interacting closely with the Berkeley School, if you like. Uh, but then the other person I want to sort of uh, name is uh, Yoshio, Yoshio Nishi, uh, who worked very closely with uh, Nishida on uh, this big uh, encyclopedia, the uh, Gengo Gaku Daiji Ten, which is like the big linguistics. Uh, dictionary uh, and uh, it covers you know it's, it's this sort of uh, reference work on all of linguistics uh, but compared to similar reference works in the West has a lot more on Sino-Tibetan there are 40 different languages covered uh, just by uh, Nishida and, uh, and Nishi with articles of sort of 20-25 pages so I think that's a, a very useful resource that doesn't get looked at as much as it should and then Nishi himself was not nearly as productive as uh, Nishida, uh, but in, in my experience, everything he wrote is rock solid, like really insightful. So I, he's another person who I think uh, is worth uh, mentioning. Um, and in my earlier presentation, you noticed that there's, there's, there's still lots of people active in Japan, uh, both uh, based around Osaka and in uh, Tokyo University of Foreign Studies, but um, but I'm not going to go into any details there. Then there's uh, what I always used to call the Leiden School, but then as I wrote that on the slide, I thought, well, now probably the Leiden Bern School, uh, associated with uh, George Van Dream, and um, and. Uh, I would say the hallmark of, of people associated with uh, 
that scene is uh, very ambitious uh, descriptive grammars for the PhD. So, uh, so I think that, um, uh, how can I say, uh, 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 a surprising amount of the new uh, knowledge uh, about Sino-Tibetan languages has been published by uh, students of uh, Fan Dream in very thick uh, volumes, most of them published by uh, Brill, but not all. And, um, and that's a, yeah, that's a different scene uh, that has been more um, focused on documentation, a little less on uh, comparative uh, linguistics, but I think that's uh, all for the best because you need good data to, to do uh, good comparative uh, research. And then there's a scene uh, that, that we can call the Oregon scene, uh, sort of built around, if you like, uh, Scott Delancey, but also uh, ideologically heavily influenced by this uh, fellow Talmi Givon, who was in, who is not a researcher in Sino-Tibetan linguistics, but is a sort of a theorist, um, who was also at Oregon. So at, at Oregon, you had sort of Givon as the theorist and Scott Delancey as a as as a Sino-Tibetan specialist. And he's also had a series of PhD students who have, who have done documentary work on Southern Tibetan languages. And his, I think his first, she was, PhD student Carol Janetti is herself just retiring this year, uh, has been based at this at University of Santa Barbara. So there's a sort of, maybe it would be better to call it the West Coast scene, um, except that that would exclude, because Berkeley is also on the West Coast. Um, but anyhow, so that's, that's another... Uh, Scene, and then I think they uh, have, it's a little bit artificial to say these things, but have been really uh, prioritizing uh, typology per se. So whereas um, Mattisaw students were, were doing reconstruction and Fendream students were, were just doing sort of very um, traditional descriptive linguistics in, 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 a, in a more or less structuralist approach, uh, in in um, in Oregon, they they focus a lot on on, on typological uh, characteristics in their uh, descriptions. And then there's uh, Paris, uh, which is kind of newer to the scene of scenes, uh, and I would associate with Guillaume Jacques, uh, who uh, who is at the CNRS in Paris. And uh, he works on uh, Gaurong, and his students mostly work on other, uh, uh, let's say, other forms of Gyarong. Uh And that is, uh, has, has created a kind of tight-knit group that, that is, is writing research that interacts with each other uh, very profitably. Um, and as I mentioned before, it, I think one thing that Guillaume can be commended for is just noticing the importance of, uh, of the Gyaronic languages uh, and their documentation has, has benefited Sino-Tibetan linguistics a great deal. There's, there's something like 300, 400 Sino-Tibetan languages. So we're clearly not at the point where we can, we can reconstruct the proto-language and explain how they, how it emerges as different, uh, uh, daughter languages in the way that happens, for instance, in Indo-European. Uh, instead, solid reconstruction is done at the at the at the subgroup level, uh, where what people do is associate correspondence patterns like this, you know, Latin P, German F, with uh, proto segments. And there's nothing wrong with that per se. In fact, it's you know, in my own methodological remarks a few hours ago, it's what I said should happen. But there tend, it tends to sort of stop there, where you sort of find a correspondence pattern, propose a, a, a reconstruction, and then reconstruct a vocabulary. Whereas, you know, in, in what you should do is formulate uh, sound changes that state very pre precisely the phonological environment and the relative chronology of the sound changes. Uh, it's not enough to know, you know, that that uh, this change into this and this change into that, but rather you need to know what happened first, what happened next. 
and uh, there is a tendency uh, among um, reconstructions at the subgroup level to kind of sweep enough tricky things under the rug that any one reconstruction cannot be used to predict attested forms. And I see that as the the kind of major failing of the reconstruction systems that are around is that is that you know in the best case you should be able to say okay here's my reconstruction here's the historical phonology of this language and you can apply those rules to those forms and get the attested forms and that tends to be uh, impossible or nearly impossible using most of the reconstructions that have been published in in sign of linguistics So uh, now this is back to a methodological principle about uh, distinguishing inheritance and borrowing, which is why relative chronology is important. Uh, namely, that if two languages share a sound change uh, that occurred in their respective histories subsequent to a sound change they didn't share, then it's uh, a contact-induced sound change or a coincidence. Which is, you know, let's say going back to our, our P changes to F example, if we could prove that, uh, let's say, English and German, let's say, German was affected by some sound change that had to come before the P to F change, then we would have to conclude that the P to F change was a coincidence in German and in English, right? So uh, let's say, I'm not sure I put that very well. Uh, when two languages share a change, the default assumption is they share a change because that change happened only once when they were the same language. That's just Occam's razor, right? It's easier to propose one change than two changes. But you can sometimes show that one of the two languages had to participate in a change before that shared change. I'll give some examples. And that would prove that they have to be two events. And we don't go through this work in general in sign of Tibetan linguistics, which means we can't rigorously distinguish uh, inherited vocabulary and borrowing. So just some examples of the sort of thing I'm talking about. Initial manner induced tonal splits around the same time in Chinese, Karen, Burmish, Loloish, Thai, and Vietnamese. Uh, I realize I misspelled Vietnamese. Uh, so, so we know in, in for Thai and Vietnamese it's a coincidence because they, uh, or or let's say it's it's contact induced because they're not even related languages. But the question arises, for instance, when Burmish and Loloish underwent a similar tone split, is it one event, you know, because Lolo Burmese was still one language, or is it uh, through contact? That kind of thing has yet to be well worked out. Another uh, example is there's a change of S to T, which seems quite strange. You know, it's not like P to F uh, that happens all the time all over the world. Uh, so S to T uh, that Van Beek takes as diagnostic of Kuki Chin. So let's take just a word like well, tree we saw before is something like Sin or Sing in Sino-Tibetan. So in Kuki Chin languages, you have Tin or Ting. And that's a very peculiar change, so he sees that as kind of diagnostic of uh, Kui Chin, but the same change is also attested in other Sino-Tibetan branches, Tongkul, Bodogaro, and Bangru. And, and this is where, like, I mean, you know, this is why this is at the, you know, the full front of, of research. It's not clear whether this is coincidence or it's contact-induced or maybe all of the S to T languages are actually secretly uh, part of the same um, branch. Uh, all of these languages are sort of between Northern Burma and Northeast India, although in some cases with big gaps between them. So, um, so it's not clear what, what's going on there. Uh, and another uh, case that is more clear but makes it a good methodological point is uh, R change to Ya, R change to Ya, in uh, in standard Burmese and in in, in Lachid. so this is the kind of a textbook case, right? You say, okay, ra changed to ya, uh, 
in, uh, in Burmish because it's affected Lashi and it's affected uh, Burmese. But written Burmese still distinguishes R and it's transliterated as Y and the Arakanese dialect of Burmese still pronounces it as an R. So it can't be a shared innovation and it must be that probably it was a change that uh, happened when Burmese already had a kind of prestige value across the whole region and that other languages uh, kind of went along with the sound change uh, through contact with Burmese. So this is a, a great example of it's, it's you, you notice that two closely related languages share a change, you're tempted to posit that as a shared innovation indicative of the, of the, um, the group, but it's not always the case. Uh, and so it's always worth sort of testing whether or not it's the case. Tibeto-Burman, as reconstructed by uh, Benedict and Man Madisoff, had a, a simple five-vowel system, I, A, E, O, U. And Old Chinese, as reconstructed uh, since the 1980s, independently by three different research traditions, has those five plus schwa. So then the question is, well, wh what's the relationship between the schwa in Chinese and things in tibeto -Burn? And uh, Zev Handel proposed in 2008 that the change of schwa to ah is characteristic of the tibeto burman branch altogether. You know, that, that, that Sinitic has preserved the original Sino-Tibetan vowel system uh, that has, whereas tibeto burman has collapsed two vowels together. And this gets to the, uh, to the kind of nomenclature issue that I was sort of avoiding earlier which is it tends to be, if you are in the Berkeley School, you'll use this term Sino-Tibetan, uh, and then you'll say that that has two branches, Sinitic and Tibeto-Burman, whereas the other scenes are more agnostic and say like, well, you know, there's no reason to group uh, whatever 300 languages together as non-Chinese. That is something that would take a, a lot of evidence to propose. Um, but uh, at least Zev, to his credit, tried to find an isogloss that would point in that direction. But it doesn't work. And this is something that, that uh, I don't want to take too much credit. I don't think I discovered it, but it, it's mentioned in my book, uh, which is that oi uh, correspond, in, in Old Chinese corresponds to i in Burmese, as in these examples. So we have uh, fire, near, and tail. Whereas I in Old Chinese uh, corresponds to I in uh, Old Burmese, like in sand, uh, I don't know what overall definition to give here, but to be slanty or something like that. And um, something like, well, yeah, I mean, whether you're convinced by the semantics is another question, but uh, at least it works with sand. Uh, to, to, so Chinese walk, uh, lame, and then Burmese uh, push aside or, um, or avoid uh, shun. So, uh, so this means that, that Burmese, in a very specific phonetic context, distinguishes inherited ah from inherited schwa, which means that uh, Zev Handel's proposal is wrong. And uh, Guillaume Jacques has also shown that, um, oops, one more, uh, that Tongut uh, also preserves uh, the distinction between Sha and Ah. So I think that's, a, that's one sort of research theme is, is uh, what is the evidence in uh, non synodic languages for the Ah Schwa distinction, where in 2008 Handel said there won't be any because it, it, they all merged. Uh, but now it looks like, okay, they did merge in Tibetan, but they didn't merge in Burmese, they didn't merge in Tongut, and other languages it needs more study. So another one is, uh, is uvulars. Uh, so, so several um, groups of scholars, so Pieros and Starostin in, uh, in, in Russia in the 90s, and then uh, more recently uh, back, uh, Baxter and Sagar, uh, but particularly Sagar, uh, have proposed that Sino-Tibetan had uvulars, uh, and point to this uh, correspondence pattern uh, where, where Tibetan has a velar, uh, Burmese has a zero initial, and Chinese has a uvular, uh, 
if you believe in those form those reconstructions of old Chinese that have uvulars. So I'm going to just set to one side um, that question, uh, although I do, I could talk about it if you want, uh, whether or not old Chinese had uvulars. But if old Chinese had a uvular, this is where it would fit in. And we, and here's an example. So we have home in Tibetan, kim, im in Burmese, and something like kum, subterranean room in, um, in old Chinese is according to Sagar, the proposal. And then uh, strangle or squeeze, uh, suffocate. So kick in, in Tibetan, ach, which comes from ik in Burmese, and then something like kicks in, uh, in, in Chinese. And then, uh, and then here's an example to just show that, you know, the correspondence might work even when there's no Chinese uh, etymon. So I think, uh, this is a solid uh, pattern that it makes sense to reconstruct uh, to uh, to uh, the proto language, whereas there's like there's another pattern that I haven't given a slide for, which is all languages have k, all three languages have k. Then you reconstruct k, and an example for that is like uh, the word for bitter. It's like I think. Um, so, uh, but. The Berkeley School, uh, so Benedict already al already writing about uh, the idea of uh, Starin and, and uh, Starostin and Pieros, uh, really hates the idea of reconstructing uh, uvulars in Old Chinese. Uh, sorry, in Old Chinese and in Sino Tibetan, uh, and uh, and Matisoff has also, you know, come out against it. And now on to morphology. Uh, there's two things I will discuss, causative formations and person agreement. So first, causative form formations. In various Sino Tibetan languages, it's clear that there are two uh, ways of forming the causative that are around. One is with an S prefix, where you have something like, um, I don't know, pat is, means to do something, and spot means to cause someone to do it. Uh, and then another one is a liter uh, sorry uh, alternation between voiced and voiceless initials. You'll have something like um, brad means to split and prat means to cut. Um, and the traditional view, going back I think all the way to August Conradi in the 19th century, is to somehow associate these two processes to to say that the s prefix is the same phenomenon as the voicing alternation. And the way that that is done is by, uh, oh, by, is by explaining that the S prefix causes devoicing. It's pretty clear this, this, is, this is, does not work as an explanation. So Tibetan, uh, in particular, has both kinds of causatives. So if, if the voicing, al voicing alternation causative comes from the S prefix causative, then it won't work to have both. Uh, and then, um, Gyarong has, uh, has two uh, formations as well, the S prefix causative and a nasal prefix anti-causative, which is to say in, 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 in like Japu Gyarong, you would have something like prat means cut and n prat means uh, to be cut. So Guillaume Jacques thinks that it's that pre, pre nasalization that causes the voicing. So it's exactly the opposite of the, let's say the traditional explanation is the S causes the devoicing and Guillaume Jacques' uh, explanation is that the pre-nasalization associated with the anti-causative causes the, um, the, the voicing. So just to give an example, we have this Burmese uh, kya to fall or to drop versus japa uh, gyarong ungra. Uh, and then we have uh, Burmese kya with an aspirate kya uh, to bring down or lower and uh, japok gyarong kra. So, um, so you see here that, that the association of the prenasalized form in gyarong with the non-aspirate form, which comes from a vo voiced form uh, in Burmese. So that's how, let's say, the this is an example of a kind of disagreement between, if you like, the Berkeley School and, and the Paris School here. Uh, and then turning to a, a agreement, uh, 
Uh, the better studied languages don't have agreement, right? So Tibetan doesn't have agreement, Burmese doesn't have agreement, Chinese doesn't have agreement. And uh, that actually led to this, uh, this, this, this sense that uh, Antoine Maillet writes about that uh, doing historical linguistics on East Asian languages will be hard. There just isn't, you know, the, there isn't the kind of machinery in those languages that gives you things to work with like, uh, mo a, 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 like morphological alternations like agreements uh, and, you know, interesting compounding one that we're used to in, in Indo-European. So, so Meillet despaired that reconstructing Sino-Tibetan would be possible. Um, but as more languages with agreement uh, have been described, we have two possible explanations. So, or, or I should pause there and say, now Sino-Tibetan is quite interesting in terms of having some very isolating languages with simple morphology and some extremely complicated languages. So Kiranti, Gyarong have beautiful uh, agreement systems, complicated uh, consonant clusters, uh, and then, you know, Karen or Lolo Burmese have, have very, very simple sort of typical Southeast Asian uh, sort of agglutinative morphology, lots of light verb constructions, uh, simple syllable structure. Uh, and uh, I think generally speaking, a, a language family either has one typological profile or another, that's associated with the typological profile of its ancestral language. But Sino-Tibetan, we have this kind of split. So there's two explanations that are possible. One is that uh, languages with agreement share an innovation. And this is what Lapola thinks. And he calls uh, this family, the sub-branch, Rung, which, where he associates all the sub-branches together that have agreement. So he would, he would branch together Kiranti and, uh, and Changyek, for example, into Rung. Uh, and then the other uh, view out there is that languages without agreement have more or less independently lost it. And uh, that's uh, a view that Scott Delancey has been uh, a very vocal advocate of. Back in the 90s, actually, I think it was, it was mostly uh, Lapola versus uh, Fandrin, but at some point, uh, I don't know, Fandrin decided to spend his time in other ways. And, um, and it became uh, sort of Lapola versus Delancey. And, you know, depending on what your, your appetite is for academic controversy, you really can read 20 different articles where, you know, Lapola says this and Delancey says this and Lapola says this and Delancey says this. And it's all rather undignified. Um, and, uh, and personally, I think, you know, there's been more heat than light uh, created by uh, this controversy, but uh, over time, I think the descriptive work is favoring Delancey's position. So, uh, and then, and then I just want to to, to mention that I think uh, Kuki Chin stem alternation and Galronic stem alternation is a promising area of future research. And the issue, part of the issue, is that uh, Lapola sees that that pronouns are similar to affixes. You know, let's say uh, we're talking about Greek, you know, and we have a verb like histe me. Uh, uh, Lapola would say, well, me is very similar to the first person pronoun that in, you know, some of the oblique stems is something like me. So probably the, 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 the Greeks just stuck their pronoun at the end of their verb. Yeah. Uh, and I think that actually... Uh, you know, let's say that's what Vop said about Indo-European. Uh, and I think that to some extent, that's how languages get agreement systems. The question is at what time depth you're talking about. Um, and it is clear that to a certain extent, uh, parts of different agreement systems in Sinai Tibetan are recent and have been supplied by uh, pronouns, uh, it, maybe to some extent analogically. Uh, which is why I think stem alternation is a better place to look to kind of um, to kind of thread the needle of this controversy because uh, because uh, you can create suffixes analogically based on pronouns, but you don't do that with stem alternation. So if you can show that a language has an agreement system in terms of oh we use stem one 
in 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 these contexts and some two in these contexts that have to do with agreement, then that's a way of um, avoiding Lapola's criticism that it's all grammaticalization pathways. Coming to syntax, uh, the, the, the most important point to make is that it's not really clear that you can do comparative syntax, like in, in terms of reconstruction. So even in, um, so well, first of all, com to do comparative syntax, you would have to have pretty good comparative phonology and comparative morphology already worked out. And we don't have that for Simon Tibetan. Um, but even in Indo-European, uh, the methodology and if you like the possibility of comparative syntax remains insecure and controversial. And the issue here is that it's very hard to distinguish uh, uh, borrowing and shared inheritance when it comes to syntax. Whereas for phonology and morphology, we have these sound laws, these kind of systematic correspondences that, um, that help us uh, separate out what's new and what's old. But there doesn't seem to be anything like that for syntax. So it's very hard to do syntactic reconstruction. Um, and as I said very early on, uh, there isn't much of a tradition of philology and, and publishing of texts in Sino-Tibetan languages. So oftentimes, and actually I could even use the example of Kugi Chin here, you say, okay, I found a language that has really interesting stem alternation that has to do with whether something's subordinate or, or finite. So I'm going to compare across the family, you know, which languages use stem one, stem two. And then you realize that for a particular language, you only have two sentences in a text, in, in, a, in someone's PhD, where they say, oh, you use stem one like this, you use stem two like this. And they give two sentences each. It's not enough to draw any conclusions from. And the fact that text publication has been so underemphasized in uh, Sino-Tibetan linguistics means that there just isn't very much to work with. And for syntax, you need texts. Yeah? So I think comparative syntax is basically impossible and, and won't become possible in my lifetime. But uh, I still want to say that there are some obvious questions out there, like why are Chinese and Karen not verb final. Every single uh, Sino-Tibetan language is verb final except for Sinitic and Karenic. Uh, Karenic is usually explained that that's because they're so far south and they must have been in contact with other people who put verb in, in second position. That explanation doesn't work for Chinese. So how did presumably Chinese was verb final switched to putting verb in second position? Personally, I see the, 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 the use of ye as, uh, as a kind of copula at the end of a sentence as indicative of that. Uh, but that, that is controversial among sinologists. Um, uh, and it is worth saying that Chinese has been verb second since the very beginning. Oracle bone inscriptions already verb second. So, um, so, so anyhow, that's one question uh, is, is how did Chinese and Karen end up so different. And then another question I think uh, that's kind of typical of, of this part of Asia is how to handle clause chaining. And I would uh, say that part of the kind of functionalist typological orientation of most Sino-Tibetan field workers is they love to, to, to say that things are the result of grammaticalization and treat that as if that's done. You know, you say, oh, um, I don't know, uh, let me think of an, uh, you know, oh, yeah, so, so the future in French, you know, uh, je chanterai, oh, that comes from cantare habeo and is, uh, is a result of grammaticalization. Well, that might be true, but it still doesn't tell you, you know, how to use the, the future in French, right? And, and there tends to be, I think, uh, 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 a practice among uh, descriptive linguists of Sino-Tibetan languages to kind of mix up uh, synchrony and diachrony in particularly when it comes to grammaticalization. So they sort of say, oh, look, this is probably grammaticalization and treat that as if it's a synchronic description. And that's something that annoys me. And then I'll just uh, say that my hunch is that there's a lot of grammatical stuff going on in uh, clause chaining and, and converbial morphology that has yet to be discovered. Uh, 
and to just sort of um, point towards the fact that I might be right, I will point out that Tibetan, classical Tibetan, has a robust switch reference system, which, which is, you know, in case you, you're not familiar with switch reference systems, this is you have clause chaining where you would say sort of like, um, in English you might say like, having gone to the store and seeking to purchase milk while, you know, this like long series of subordinations using non-finite uh, verbs, but the choice of verb ending indicates whether or not you're talking about the same person or you're switching to talking about someone else. And in Tibetan, it's very clear that like you use, you use this one suffix if, if the story continues with the same subject and you use this and not other suffix if, if you're switching to another person. And that system was, let's say, sort of discovered around 1988 but the publication that described it was described it in extremely confusing terms and uh, was only sort of clearly written about uh, in uh, 2019 uh, by Zach Beer uh, and still hasn't hit the textbooks or, or you know, textbooks and grammars. So in Tibetan, which has been worked on for 150 years, there's a there's a a, a, a pattern of you know there's a, 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 a key grammatical feature of the language that was only uh, clearly described last year. So I think that um, that across Sino-Tibetan languages, clause chaining and the sort of syntax of clause chaining is um, is an area that is just ripe for uh, for more research uh, that is that potentially would be very insightful. Looking to the future, and this will presage uh, some of my uh, lectures from, from tomorrow, uh, we don't have enough people working in sino Tibetan linguistics. That's, <laughs> that's I think, the problem. <laughs> you know, there's, it, it, think about how many uh, people work on German or Italian or Greek or Latin, or even Chinese yeah, or Japanese. Yeah? Well, there are 300 languages in China. And, you know, après moi, each one should have a department that, that studies the, 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 the culture and language and literature of that uh, um, people. Uh, but it's not gonna happen. And we just have to accept that. So uh, for Sino-Tibetan linguistics to, to achieve things comparable uh, in impressiveness to what we've seen happen in Indo-European linguistics, we just have to become more productive. Uh, and the only way to do that is through technological innovation. So that's one of my kind of um, idée fix, if you like, is that we need to embrace technological innovation, uh, whereas people who work on Greek and Latin, maybe they don't, because there's so many of them, they, they, <laughs> they don't need to speed up their work. But, but we in, in Sino-Tibetan, we do. And I think that there are some technologies that, that, that are available for doing that that I will describe in more detail in a, a future talk. So automatic transcription of, uh, of sound files into IPA, uh, automatic glossing translation and, and, and aids to lexicography using off-the-shelf uh, natural language processing tools, and then some, some new techniques in, in automating elements of comparative linguistics uh, that we'll just, for the moment, call automatic cognate detection. And I think that, that, that uh, each of these, so I see, I see this as a sort of pipeline, and I'll return to this tomorrow, but you want to go from having sound files of you know, some toothless granny uh, telling you a story in, in, in a hill somewhere, to a dictionary and a grammar and you know, research papers. And, and we can imagine a kind of workflow pipeline that changes sound files into dictionaries or something like that. And I think that every major step along the way, there is a technology now available that would speed that up. Uh, but, but, but we're still a long way off from kind of engineering that pipeline. Yeah, so we have all the sort of pieces, but we need to kind of glue them together correctly. And I think the most important thing is to start uh, incorporating uh, a greater technological sophistication into the training of uh, linguistics students. And I think this is 
happening already, but could be happening in a more self-conscious uh, and productive way. Um, and that's something I'll also talk about in the future. Uh, and then let's say the paradox from my side is I can definitely see that this is what needs to happen, but am, am something of a Luddite, at least at the practical level myself. So, um, so I feel like, uh, you know, I, I, I can, I can kind of <laughs> tell you what I see on the horizon, but, uh, it's, it's the 30 people who are attending this today who will be more likely to actually implement that than, uh, than I am.